We're on problem 84. On a company-sponsored cruise, two-thirds of the passengers were company employees, and the remaining passengers were their guests. So we could say employees is equal to two-thirds of passengers. And I guess we could also say that guests are equal to one-third of passengers. Right? The remainder are guests. If three-fourths of the company employee passengers were managers, what was the number of company employee passengers who were not managers? OK, so statement, the second statement in the, at least the problem statement, it says if three-fourths of, of let's see, if three-fourths of the company employee passengers were managers. So company employee passengers. So three fourths of E were managers. If I read that statement, if three fourths of the company employee passengers were managers, what was the number of company employee passengers who were not managers? So we essentially, so what percentage? So essentially, they want to know what one fourth of E is, right? This is what they're asking because they want to know what were the number of company employee passengers that were not managers. And that if three-fourths were managers, one-fourth were not managers. So if we could figure out P, we would be able to figure out E, and we'd be able to figure out one-fourth E. If we were able to figure out uh, guests, we could then use that to figure out P, which we could use to figure out E, which we could then figure out one-fourth E. So that's how we should be thinking about it, not that we should be spending that much time on it. Problem number one, there were 690 passengers. 690 is equal to P. Well, that we'd be done, right? Because E is equal to 2 thirds P. And then we want to know what 1 fourth E is. So then our answer is, so the non-manager employees would be 1 fourth times E, which is just 2 thirds times P times 690. And that would be our answer. So 1 alone is sufficient. And then statement number 2, there were 230 passengers who were guests of the company employees. So they're saying essentially saying that guests are equal to guests are equal to two thirty. And then we could use this information that guests are just one third of P, so which is equal to one third of P. And then of course from there you could solve, you could multiply three times both sides of the equation to figure out that C is equal to six P is equal to six ninety. Six ninety, which is so. This is the same information that they gave in one, which was enough to solve the problem. So two alone is also sufficient. So they are each independently sufficient to solve the problem. That problem's confusing just with the language. Company employee manager passenger guests becomes very confusing. Eighty-five in the x-y plane. Does the point four comma twelve lie on line K? Okay, this is interesting. So let's let me draw a line K, and I'll worry about the point four comma twelve later. So let's see. They say let me look at the points that they do say lie on K. So they, let me. So if this is the x-axis, that's the y-axis. Statement one tells us that the point one seven lies on K. So the point one comma seven lies on K. One comma seven. And then they also tell us that the point well, you know, that alone isn't going to let me know if the point four comma twelve lies on it. So one, two, three, four, four, comma twelve. It might be up here. All right, this is the point that we care about. If you can see that, let me scroll down. Four comma twelve. So if the line looks like that, maybe it go goes through it, but the line could be like that. So statement number one alone isn't enough. Statement number two says the point minus two comma two. So minus two minus two comma minus two x is minus two y is positive two so they're saying that lies on it eyeballing it it seems minus two comma two eyeballing this line k it seems like four comma twelve could very well lie on it but we have to do a little bit of math to figure it out so first of all just statement two by itself doesn't help us because this line could go anywhere you need two points to just know what the line is and so how do we figure out if the point 4, 12 is on this line? Well, the easiest way to do it is to figure out the slope. Well, I don't know if this is the easiest way, but it's the way I would think about doing it, is to figure out the slope of the line. 
and then extend that slope here and see if the point 4, 12 lies on it. So let's see, what's the slope of this line? So when we went up 7 minus 2, so the rise is 5. When you go up 5, we went over how much? 1 minus minus 2, we went over 3. Right? So for every 3 that you move over, you go up 5. That's the easiest way to think about it. So when we go from, we're going from x is equal to 1 to x is equal to 4, so we're going to the right by 3. And so we should be going up 5. So 5 plus 7, sure enough, is equal to 12. So these, so if you just extend the slope, it does hit the point 4, 12. So both statements combined are, well, actually, you know what? I just wasted a lot of your time. Because we just have to know whether the data is sufficient to answer the question. We don't have to prove that the question is true. I've just proven to you that, that 4, 12 does lie on the line. But you could have just said, oh, well, you know what? Statement number one gives me a point on the line. That alone isn't enough to solve the problem. Statement number two gives me another point. And then at this point, if you're really you know, taking the GMAT and time matters, you just say, hey, I got two points for this line. Two points is everything I need to know about a line. Once I know two points on a line, I can figure out if any other point is on that line. I'm done. Both statements combined are sufficient. You wouldn't have to do all of this stuff that I did, which would waste your time. But if you just to prove to you that you could figure it out, I, I did that. But anyway, I have to admit I did waste your time a little bit. You should just immediately say, oh, I got two points on a line. Once I have two points, it's, I can completely figure out if I can, if I, if any other point lies on that line, 86. The length of the edging that surrounds circular garden K is, OK, so we have two gardens, it looks like. So we have circular garden K, and then we have circular garden, let's see, what does it say? It is 1 half the length of the edge that surrounds circular garden G. So this is circular garden G. This is K. This is g. So they're saying the length of the edging that surrounds circular garden k is 1 half the length of the edging that surrounds circular garden g. So we could say circumference of k, right? that's the edging that surrounds it, is equal to 1 half the circumference of g. Fair enough. What is the area of garden k? Assume that the edging has negligible width. Well. A couple of things. If we know the circumference, we know the area, right? Because the circumference is 2 pi r, and once we know r, area is pi r squared. So if we can figure out the circumference of, of k, then we know its area. And if what, likewise, if we know anything about the radius or the diameter or the area of c of g, we can figure out a circumference. If we know its area, we can use the formula area equals pi r squared, right? Pi r squared to figure out what r is. And then we, once you figure out r is, you can figure out that circumference is equal to 2 pi r. So if you have any of this information, you're able to figure out any of the rest of it. So statement number one says, the area of g is equal to 25 pi square meters. So let me write it. Area of g is equal to 25 pi. So immediately you should say, hey, if I know the area of g, I can figure out the radius of g. And if I know the radius of g, I can figure out the circumference of g. If I know the circumference of g, I can figure out the circumference of k. If I know the circumference of k, I can figure out the radius of k. And if I know the radius of k, I know the area of k. And you shouldn't have to calculate any of that. So this is enough. This is sufficient. Statement two, and maybe I'll do that for you just to show you that it, it, it can be done. But I, hopefully it's making, it's making some sense. The edging around g is 10 pi meters long. So they're actually giving us, they're telling us that the circumference of g is equal to 10 pi. So this is even easier. They're giving us this. That means the circumference of k is 5 pi, which means that we can figure out the radius of, of k, and we can figure out the area. So this is also sufficient to solve the problem. And just so you, know, you don't take a word for it, let me just show you how quickly you could figure it out. If the area of g is 25 pi, that means that pi times the radius squared of g is equal to 25 pi. That means that the radius is equal to 5, right? Cancel out the pi on both sides. r squared equals a 5. It means the radius is 5. That means the circumference is 2 pi times this. So that means that the circumference of g is equal to 2 pi times 5, which is 10 pi. 
which is exactly what statement 2 told us. And then from there, we could figure out the circumference of k, which is half of that. So circumference of k is equal to 5 pi. And then we know that 2 pi times the radius of k is equal to 5 pi. Divide both sides by pi. We know that the radius is equal to 5 halves. And then the area of k would be pi times this squared. So it would be pi times 25 over 4. And we'd be done. But all of this is a waste of time. I just wanted to show you that you once you have the radius or the circumference or the area of either of these, you're able to figure out everything else. And I'm out of time. See you in the next